Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I know um, that it's the weekend, which is typically when we get our rest so we can take care of these dark circles under our eyes from teaching and maybe go get some Botox from the wrinkles, the student induced wrinkles, if you will. Um, but I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad to give you some extra credit on this wonderful Saturday. I'm Joe Dombrowski. I'm coming to you live from Seattle, Washington, but let's not get it twisted, baby. I'm from Detroit and don't you forget it. I'm a 10 year elementary school teacher and comedian currently teaching kindergarten, which is as psychotic as it sounds. Um, super glad to be here today so we can learn all about how we can continue to be creative in the classroom. Consider this informal professional development where your boss isn't sitting right across the table from you so you can be in your pajamas you you don't even need the pajamas on if we're being honest okay the stakes are low here but the learning is high i'm excited to learn some things too we have educators from all around the world who are going to be talking to us about their trials and tribulations about teacher technology during the pandy uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Our very first teacher is Nicholas Provenzano. He comes from my state of Michigan. So this is Tech Teacher Moments with Nicholas Provenzano. Hey, baby. How are you, buddy? It's good to see you. I miss you. I miss you too, buddy. I miss you too. It's been quite some time since we uh, were singing Baby Shark before it was cool, right? Oh God. <laughs> well, we're gonna let the we're gonna let the fans you know a little secret. Uh, Nicholas and I actually used to get, work together at the Michigan Association for High School Leadership Summer Camp. We were summer camp counselors for uh, student leaders all across the state of Michigan, and now we're reconnected here together. Glad to have you, bud. I'm glad to be here. So you are like Mr. Teacher Tech in, uh, <laughs> oh God, the whole world, pretty much. Talk to me a little bit more about who you are, what you do, and why you're here today. Yeah, uh, I spent uh, 15 years teaching uh, high school English. Uh, that's when you knew me last. And then uh, the past four years, I've moved to a position where I'm doing uh, makerspace and technology for a middle school. Really, uh, it's my opportunity to really support teachers and students as they dive more deeply into uh, project-based learning and really seeing how technology can be used to support learning and growth for all of our students. So that's sort of what I do. And occasionally I'll write some books and I'll uh, speak and do professional development for schools all over the, the world. Uh, and occasionally I get to hang out with cool people like you. So it's a uh, a crazy world we live in right now. And I give you a lot of credit for teaching middle school. There are not enough Glade plugins in this world to get me to deal with those middle school smells. So congratulations <laughs> on bowing to you. But okay, you said book. My teacher ears immediately shout out. Talk to me a little bit more about that. Yeah, uh, I've written a few books uh, that can really help teachers really explore project-based learning, uh, maker spaces, maker ed. So if you uh, go to Amazon and search Nicholas Provenzano, you'll find some books. Uh, you'll find your starter guide to makerspaces, which sort of details how you can dive into building a makerspace. The Maker Mentality, which is about the culture of making and from the point of view of administrators, teachers, and students. And then my latest book, which is an exploration of project-based learning called Beyond the Poster Board. So what I want teachers to do is to take that step beyond having kids glue things onto a poster board and really see what project-based learning can do for your students. And sometimes it involves great tools and technology like Spark from Adobe. And sometimes uh, it includes something a little bit more complex uh, digitally, which could be Minecraft Education Edition. So it's a lot of great tools out there to really help students create artifacts to demonstrate their understanding. And really it's been a lifesaver for me during this pandemic when we were locked down last year and then this hybrid environment that I'm teaching in right now. And I think it's super cool that we're both here today, elementary, you know, uh, lower education and higher education, makerspaces and project-based learning, it can be used 
from kindergarten to college. And it really is a great way for not only students to get creative, but teachers to get creative as well. What types of things have you noticed um, have been the greatest accomplishments when you start using technology in these creative ways in your room? Well, what I like about it is that it really gives kids an opportunity to try and fail without you know, the waste of resources, right? There's always this fear of, you know, I've, I've built something out of popsicle sticks and well, it didn't work out and crap, I have to start over and I need a ton more popsicle sticks. So to be able to have a digital approach sometimes allows kids to sort of make, remake, make, remake over and over again without the worry of resources. And to some degree, it brings a little bit of equity too, because those resources digitally, those kids have access to all those same tools. So one example is my use of Minecraft. Kids love Minecraft. Minecraft is still a international hit. And so the education edition gives kids the opportunity to create and build. And just yesterday, my kids were rebuilding our middle school in Minecraft. They were running around the building and they were you know, looking and doing measurements and saying, okay, the hallway has this many you know, spots and tiles on the floor before this door. And you know, to see them excited and what they were doing, you know, learning through measurements and learning through trial and error, all of these other skills the kids were learning during this process, that if I told them that's what they were gonna learn, they would shut down. But just giving them the opportunity to build and explore, they work on those skills that are really important. And understanding your physical space is really for middle schoolers with their bodies, right? And yeah. they just don't know, they're just all over the place. So to like look at their space and see you know, how things are spaced out and why things are a certain way is really important part of really growing up and learning about your physical space. Now, I talk to a lot of uh, first year teachers and uh, teachers who are in their pre-service teaching at colleges and universities across the country. And I always tell them, you have to be one step ahead of the students and you have to think about what is it that's not school related that they're super into and how can you bring that into the classroom and, and hook them with it and do it? And I mean, Minecraft is perfect. Question for you. Have you dabbled with Among Us in the classroom? Because that <laughs> is the thing right now. Um, I haven't done Among Us in the classroom, but uh, what I have done is I've done the Hunger Games in Minecraft. So, <laughs> was the Hunger Games like circa 2013 or something? But yeah. they they love they. I mean, the Hunger Games is still a very popular series, and the movies are still very popular. And uh, in Minecraft, you can set it up so it's like the Hunger Games, where there are certain uh, weapons and tools and stuff in the center, and you say go as the teacher, and they have to run and get the things, and then they spread out uh and try to <laughs> survive as long as they can um among us hasn't quite fit uh my curriculum for a design class uh, that i teach uh innovation class just yet uh the kids love it though and i think it, it's super fun i mean my son is nine and uh you know he definitely watches a handful of youtube videos uh on among us and his favorite youtubers so i haven't quite got there yet with among us and I, i've definitely seen some things where teachers could do that and i think you know, having students design potential play fields, right, of what Among Us could take place in or what some of those tasks could be uh, that they would have to perform. So sort of like a, a thought experiment to have kids walk through that process of like, how would you make this better? You know, what would you improve? I think those are important things to do. Um, and I know that every school has different rules regarding things like you know, YouTube in your school or things like playing Among Us and what's allowed and what's not. So while you might not be able to have Among Us digitally in your classroom, you can have kids physically take out pencil and paper and design and build and create all of these things. And then you, they're still having that same experience and they're still having that same design experience, uh, whether it's digital or physical. Let me ask you this. Uh, what advice would you give to a teacher who kind of feels like they're not ready to dabble into getting creative with technology and they feel like they're only able to do what the district gets them? What advice do you give to a teacher who wants to be creative with technology and step out of their box? So 
one of the things that I, I, I tell teachers when I am speaking from them, whether you know, East Coast, West Coast, overseas, is the number one thing is that we have to be comfortable as teachers with failing in front of our students. It's the biggest thing that prevents teachers from really trying new things. It's this idea of, what if it doesn't work and the students, you know, look at me and it fails? That's okay. I tell my students all the time, this is brand new. I've never done it before. This either could be awesome or it could totally blow up in my face, but let's explore it together. And the kids buy into that. They're like, oh, okay, cool. And they provide you that feedback. Well, what if we did it this way? Or what if we did it that way? There's this feeling as teachers, and sometimes it comes from our university classes, that we are in charge and we are the person the kids look to for all of the answers. And it's such a flawed system now. We no longer live in a world where you have your teacher manual has all the answers and the kids are remembering, memorizing facts and then you have the answers. You know, if you're just a, a, a receptacle of facts that you're spitting out, you're replaced by the internet. You were replaced by the internet 20 years ago. You know, that's just it. You are someone that needs to help guide kids explore those skill sets. And so being afraid of not knowing something it has to be gone. And so that's your first step is being okay with not knowing. The next step is to take that risk and try the little thing baby step wise, right? T try a little bit. And one of the things that I have found is a great success in getting administrators or schools to allow teachers to take those extra steps is to call something a pilot. Say, I would love to pilot using X, Y, or Z. And what a pilot does is that it has a built-in sort of thought that well, it's not permanent, but you're going to try it out and then you're going to report back to us how it went. And so administrators feel more comfortable allowing for pilots because they're not committing to making this thing happen. And you're basically saying, I understand this isn't a long-term commitment, but honestly, every single pilot I've ever done anywhere has ended up becoming just a part of our school structure. Because as a teacher, you have to feel confident that what you're going to do is going to work. You've done the research and you're going to try it and you're gonna show them that it works out. And so by taking that step as really a teacher leader to say, I believe in this, this is gonna happen, please let me try it out and I'll let you know how it goes, is the next step after you feel comfortable with something not working. And that is the key because for me, technology is never on your side. Like you can be as prepared <laughs> as possible and something is going to go wrong. How do you overcome that? I think you overcome that by just being honest with the kids and going, okay, this clearly isn't working and pivoting. And the pivot is the go-to teacher move in any situation whatsoever. And sometimes it's just having that conversation of, okay, this is what we we're gonna try to accomplish. Does anyone know a better way to do this than what this tool was supposed to do? And you'll be surprised at how often your kids say, well, we could use this, or I've tried this, or another teacher did this. And trust me, we've all been there. That you know, moment where your heart drops, where you see no internet connection, right? It pops oh, up God, on your screen, no. right? <laughs> and like you're like, oh, okay, <laughs> the rest of my day is going to be completely different. And, and it happens. Like there's just no internet. It goes down for us, and you don't know, right? It's nebulous. Is it five minutes? Is it fifty minutes? I don't know. You still got the kids uh, in front of you. So you know, as a teacher. I, I, it's just part of what we do, which is constant problem solving, right? It's just constant curveballs that are going to be thrown at you from a, a kindergartner, a sixth grader, a junior in high school. They're going to say or do something or the facilities aren't going to be working the way that you want them to do. The technology is not going to work. And you just pivot on the spot. You know, as an yeah, English teacher, it could be, okay, guys, hey, we're going to read this short story now. This is what we're going to do. Uh, you can always find that thing and it's so personal for you as a teacher, but the worst thing you can do is panic and, you know, it will happen. happen. You will. Yeah, panic. Yeah. <laughs> but not let the kids see you freak out. <laughs> just, right. just roll with it and go, Hey guys, this is what happens. What can we do? Like, how do you want to spend this time until we figure it out? And remembering that kids are a part of your class, not this entity that comes into your space and you have to deal with, um, and they, you know, right, they're part of this problem solving as well. So instead of looking at them as part of the problem, I need to give something for them to do. 
look at them as part of the solution, right? Okay, guys, what do we, you know, what can we do together to deal with this time where X, Y, Z isn't working? I have to tell you, this week, I had such a snafu with technology in the classroom. Uh, so I've, my school is all in person. Parents have the option to have their kids be remote. So if they are remote, then that teacher is teaching hybrid. I was fortunate enough to have no kindergartners opt for hybrid wow. until Tuesday, randomly. So, so <laughs> student randomly goes hybrid. Uh, it's like 745, school starts at eight, and I'm like, okay. So I'm bringing up my Zoom rooms, I'm trying to share my screen. I was on two different computers at once, and I couldn't open my Zoom waiting room. So I ended up not letting them in the entire day. <laughs> Thank God the parents were so cool about it. They're like, we understand this was last minute. We, we totally appreciate everything that you're doing and allowed me to collect myself too. And I was very frustrated, but at the end of the day, I learned something. You learn mm -hmm. from these mistakes. Like I now, I now understand that it's much easier to have one computer be totally designated to Zoom and then your other ones where you're doing your teaching on the board and stuff like that. And uh, I feel like now I can more quickly prepare myself for you know teaching hybrid on the fly, which is absolutely psychotic, but with every fail, you learn something, which is the name of the game. Well, and I think as we all look back on the, these pandemic times and we look at the different tools that we used to support our instruction, instead of going, okay, things are normal, toss aside all the stuff that I did and go back to the way that I used to do things, I think that's a huge mistake. I think now's the perfect opportunity to sort of take stock in the tools that you've been using. And you know, one tool that we use has been uh, Seesaw, which is a portfolio tool. Oh, yeah. to post all of, right? So now I have teachers saying, I'm not going back from this. This is great. All of my kids now can post all of their stuff digitally. I have access to it. And now I can you know, provide feedback in a more meaningful way than I was before. And the other one on top of that, I know this is an Adobe event, but Adobe Spark has been huge for me in my classroom. It's it's something that is going to become a legitimate part of what I do when it comes to students creating digital content. Because when I was like locked down last year, right, all online, I needed a tool that kids could use to create. And I wanted them to create, you know, video or websites or, and Spark was so awesome at that because it gave kids the options to create what they wanted to and, and in a class in particular that's about creating a lot of physical things yeah to have a website that is allowed that allows you to take those images and then create these uh digital uh representations whether they're websites or videos or things like that is an awesome combination to have and so i really want to encourage people to really think about what they've started to use this year and how they can continue that use to really support student learning moving beyond this pandemic uh, we had one person write in and agrees with you. Andrea Batts Latson said, great point. We were placed by the internet years ago. We are here to guide them to this information. Great perspective, Nick. So I appreciate that. Um, Nick, thank you so much for joining us today. I, it was wonderful to reconnect to you and to feed off your energy. And I even <laughs> learned a few things. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And, you know, I'd love to connect with all of you guys. You can find me on the internet set at The Nerdy Teacher on Twitter and Instagram and uh, my site, thenerdyteacher.com. So I'd love to connect with all of you guys. And if you have tons of questions about maker ed or project-based learning, uh, please reach out. I'd love to connect with all of you guys. And Joe, <laughs> awesome. thanks for having me here. Thanks, Nicholas. Uh, Joe Reed, I saw that you wrote in the comments, you said, how do I get Nick's t-shirt? It said, get creative in technology. Um, that is an Adobe t-shirt. Mm, you might want to stick around. We might give, be giving away uh, some of those shirts and some more cool stuff later in the, the extra credit session. So hang on and we'll go there. Now, when I think about myself as just, as an educator, we're lifelong learners. We never stop learning. If you're still teaching in the style that you were when you were a first year teacher, ooh, good luck to those students. You're gonna have some angry parent emails. We're constantly learning, we're constantly growing, we're constantly developing, which is why I feel so fortunate to have Adobe here with me today 
They're gonna give me a quick tutorial so we can learn more about Adobe Spark. So let's get into it. Hi. Tanya, how are you? Mm, I think we're having a little bit of a technical issue. I, I can't hear you. Do you know a sign language? No, no, that's not a technical issue. That's just like every other teacher who forgets to uh, unmute when they're talking. Did it. We're just going to let it slide. <laughs> <laughs> Look at my red face for that one. <laughs> now, Atanya comes to us, former teacher, now with Adobe, here to teach me all about the things that I can start using in my classroom. Um, take it away. Teach me, teacher. Right. I am your all humble right. servant. And I I am always a teacher. I am just teaching teachers now. So it's just a different- Oh, once a teacher, always yes. a teacher. Always a teacher. So I'm gonna, okay, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna share my screen in just a second. And what we're gonna do, Joe, is we're gonna do uh, a live demo. But what we're gonna do is we're going to re-explore a character in Lord of the Flies visually. All right. So have you done your homework? I hope you did your homework, let Joe. Me, let me just stop you right there. Okay, do you know that I live Lord of the Flies every single day? It's me <laughs> on the recess playground with 60 kindergartners running around. They could take me out at any minute. <laughs> I love it. Okay, good. So then you're gonna have some thoughts around this. And so what we're gonna do is this is Adobe Spark. Um, and what I'm gonna do really quickly is a high level kind of walkthrough of posts, video, and really quick page, okay? So we're gonna do yeah. this like record speed. And I'm gonna teach you how to use this. But I want you to think about, you know, we're hearing about Spark. Spark is completely a free tool for schools. It's completely equitable. And if you're watching and you don't have it for uh, EDU, you wanna go to spark.adobe.com forward slash EDU. And you definitely wanna be using the school account because your students' information and data is safe. We're not selling anything to anybody. And uh, they get all the upgraded features, all right? So it's, it's, it's really great if you haven't been using it yet. But let me kind of walk you through the first step. So first of all, on Spark, there's three things you could do, video, graphics or web pages. So let's do this. So I'm going to go into custom size graphic. I'm going to go into popular okay. and I'm going to choose square. Just Wait, hold on. So I can, I, that showed me that I can make different templates to automatically fit various social media platforms. Oh yeah, Joe. <laughs> now you're yeah. speaking my love language. Yeah, right, right. So just as a teacher, <laughs> FYI, if you're going in and you are, uh, you know, you want to create something quick, you can go in here, you can go to self social post. It has like everything you need to kind of get started. Twitter, social profile. I, I also like this for kids too, because I've been thinking about it. And Joe, even if you're teaching like fourth grade or 12th grade, if you're teaching history or a character analysis, you should have your kids creating a whole social media profile for any book in a character oh, and, yeah. and the whole thing. Like I'm just, I've been thinking about it. And I'm like, that is so much fun. And it's really great digital citizenship to teach kids. And real life learning. Let's be real. They're going to be on social media, whether you like it or not. Oh, a hundred percent. And how are they leveraging it in a meaningful well to tell the story in a meaningful way to tell the stories that they want to tell, not someone else telling it for them. So here's the thing. First thing I could go in and I could choose a template there's over 37,000 pre-created templates. So teachers, you can go in here and literally find like templates for anything, but I'm not going to get into that right now, just for the sake of time. What I want to do with you right now is build something out really fun. And what we're going to do is we're going to recreate, as I mentioned, a um, six word summary of piggy. Okay. Great. So we're going to, we're going to like choose a character and we're going to do a six word kind of like memoir of piggy, but we're going to do it visually. This is such a fun activity to do with kids. So first things first, I'm going to X out here. I'm going to go in here into photos and I'm going to go find free photos. Now I've been doing some digging before, but I don't want to jump ahead. I want to have a like background. So Joe, cause I had to do some homework. What would be like a, keyword we would search for for background i'm gonna go ahead and say pig oh 
As our background? Oh, or maybe a fly. <laughs> or maybe okay. the Lord. I don't know. Okay. Oh my God, I love you. Okay, so here, I'm going to do tropical island. Joe did not do his homework. No, it's I, I went a little too literal with it. We're just going to roll with the punches. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. You're good. So, and I'm, I, I, I'm the one that mutes myself and doesn't spell things properly. I'm that teacher anyway, so it's fine. So we're going to go in here and I'm going to just choose a background. Okay. And I'm going to just like add it to the back, Joe. Do you see how easy that was? Boom. Add to the back. Now, if I'm in here, I can like replace it. I can do different things in here. I can add different filters. Um, but I'm going to continue looking. So um, I want to add some. So, so you said something. You said pig. So I'm actually going to go in and I'm going to go and I'm going to find wild pig. And I keep on messing this up. So here we go. So wild pig. I'm going to pull in my pig picture. I'm going to go in here really quickly. I'm going to pull in um, a conch because that's something that they use in there um, on island. All right, Joe. What are the other things? Do you remember Piggy? I don't know if you remember anything about his face, something that, that was really important to him. Yeah, that it was that one thing that was on his face that was really important. That it thing was. That, he had. that thing that I wear too. Yep, those eyeglasses. Yes, so we're going to have eyeglasses, okay. And we're going to also, you know, they, they would find things that they were eating, right? And fruits, you know. So we're going to kind of just pull some of this out. I don't know if they had oranges. That, but look, I have all this stuff, and right now it looks kind of icky. Like, this is not what exactly I would want. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to press remove background. And I'm going to create a really quick visual representation of some, I, I'm not really 100%. Let's see, how is this going to look with the white? But I'm going to pull out, and this is really cool. So kids can really quickly create really beautiful graphics and oh, collages. Wow. Yeah, do you see that? So yeah. something that you used to have to like have way more skill set to yeah, be able patience. to do mm -hmm, <laughs> is really, really simple and um, easy. Okay, so I'm going to really quickly pull that and then I, you know, I'm going to teach the kids about like design and where to put things and, and then I'm going to go in here and I'm going to add some text and I'm going to do like a really quick six word memoir. I'm just choosing that text right now. <laughs> Everything will be okay. I don't know about that one. That's ironic. That's right. Ironic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know about Is that. that the word not. <laughs> no, probably not. So um would you happen to have any words for a six word memoir that you might be thinking about this is bananas b-a-n-a-n-a-s i don't know i all i can okay. think of is the plot is just so twisted how about this i Innocent love it and insecure but strangely intelligent that's a really great way of and i i i'm not gonna lie i totally pulled that off the internet i played dress <laughs> But I, I put that in. And so if I was going to do like a six word memoir, um, which is a great way of using. Ooh, okay. Yeah. And then I can go in here and I can find different, you know, styles really quick, you know, find one that I like. So let's say, ooh, I don't like that one. All right. Let's say I like that one and I'm going to just change the color to white. And then what I'm going to do right now really quick is I'm going to download it. Now, this is the best part. Okay. So I'm app smashing. Joe, do you know what an app smash is? I'm, no. Okay, an app smash is basically when you take one app from one, one creation from one app, and then you pull it into a new app to do something even more creative that you might not have been able to do in just one. And it's okay. teaching kids how to be digitally fluent. Right? right. It's teaching them how to creatively problem solve and pull. So I love this because like you can use Spark, but you can also bring stuff in into Rush. You can use, you know, you know, as students get stronger in their tech skills, they're going to learn how to use Illustrator and they're going to use Photoshop and they're going to use Premiere Pro and then they're going to use Character Animator and they're going to learn how to use all these crazy tools together but they have to learn skills it. first right so i just did that i'm gonna go here and then i'm gonna i know you got it you got your busy guy you got lots of people to interview so we're gonna finish but i'm gonna do this and i'm gonna go make my thinking visible this okay. thinking very important yeah so this is the best part so i can start with like a story stem if i wanted it's fantastical but just for the sake of time right now i'm gonna go and start from scratch and this is the best part we're gonna have students press record 
make their thinking visible, adding good cognitive questioning and, you know, pulling in more, pulling out more, right? Having kids creating a documentation of things that they're working on, retelling stories. This is all so important. Wouldn't you say, Joe? I do. Well, first of all, P.S., I could also um, upload a photo. I could, um, if you have, I could take a picture. Hey. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I could take a picture in there right off the bat. Um, and then what I could do is I'm going to go here and I'm going to upload a photo in from here. And I'm going to, and I could also create stuff straight in there, but I'm going to go in here and I'm going to explain my thinking. Piggy, innocent and insecure, but strangely intelligent. This is what I got out of reading about Piggy in Lord of the Flies. And I would, you know, obviously I would add more good questioning for my students and add more perspective and, you know, scaffold that a little bit stronger. Um, but just really quickly, I could go here. I can add um, a different kind of music. Here we go. Um, and then I'm going to go preview. Actually, it seems like it was a bit of a horror show. So I'm going to go into horror movie because he, it's not ending well. And no. that is incredible. <laughs> I, my like brain synapses are going crazy right now because I know exactly how I'm going to use this in the classroom. Oh, I love it. Good. And it is easy enough that a kindergartner or a 12th grader could use this and it I would still that. look great. And it will, it's fast. You don't have to do, do you see, I just did this demo in like two minutes. Yeah. Right. And then you have page, which basically is just a scrolling web page that I could then take this share, publish, create a link and then Not a bone. paste it inside of my page. And then add more visuals, add more writing, and voila, I have a portfolio. So I love that. that's some of the things that we could do. I know we don't have a lot of time, but that's I okay. want to share a little thing with you so that you can use it in your class. And if you guys have any ways that are going across in your brain right now that you're already thinking how you can use this in your classroom, please type them in the comments. We can all learn from each other. Tanya, I feel like I'm a smarter, wiser man because I have extracted your Adobe knowledge. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I oh really, God. really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm enjoying this show so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you to all of you guys for coming and watching. I'd love to learn more about how you might be creating. Please, please, please reach out with me on Twitter at Tiny Averitt and uh, at um, hashtag Adobe EDU Creative. All right. Well, enjoy the show, everybody. Thanks, Tanya. You get extra credit. Uh, you guys, I'm, I'm loving it. Thank you for being here with us today. You're going to love our next guest, all right? Now, let's think about how much teaching has changed in the past year, right? Like, what is normal? Do we even know anymore? And what will normal be when we live in a post-pandemic world? I'm so happy to have O.C. Ejiofor here with us today to talk to us about not back to normal. <laughs> Hey, 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 Joe, how are you? I'll give well, you a round of applause. You, man. Good to have you today. I'm giving you a round of applause. It's been an excellent show so far. I'm enjoying this. I'm really round enjoying it. The applause it. comes to you. You're coming to me all the way uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. Where are you at? That's right. Yeah, across the pond. I'm here in Essex, sunny Essex. It's, it's always sunny here over in England. Um, but yes, that, that's where I'm located. I'm just happy to be here and hear some of the great things that happen on the show and excited about this topic as well. Not back to normal. It's very, very timely. Very timely. Extremely timely. Now you are, you're like Mr. Technology. I'm over here on your blog, looking at the things that you're doing. I wish that I was as smart as you. I'm not. Can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, who you are and what you're doing and how you have all this technological information for education? Okay, sure. So as you said, my name is OC. I, um, I'm just literally just a guy. I've been a teacher uh, since 2008-ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, quite literally, I have 
learn well when i came into teaching first of all right now what i do is i train teachers i've taught in the classroom for uh, about 15 years and i came out because i love helping people it's what i did as a class teacher that led me to middle leadership it's what i did in middle leadership that led me to senior leadership and now i'm helping as many schools and individuals as i can i'm uh, very passionate about those who feel afraid to ask because when people know tech they tend to talk about it in a way that it makes it seem easy. Whereas there are some people out there that really need it slowed down. They really need just, please let me ask this question. That's where I, I love those people. They're my friends. They're my friends. I like helping them. I needed you like six years ago. I, <laughs> I wish we met earlier. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, ed tech and how can we start you know making those small moves to to really learn and grow with our our database of what we can do yeah sure I, I think it begins with one useful application at a time because we practice with what we need that's what we do we have lots of new technology presented to us um and we have our training and we're expected to just use it. And sometimes what happens is when the scrutiny comes off, when the nobody's looking or expecting anymore, those uh, the use of that tech falls off. So it's usually about finding that one thing that you know actually helps your practice and practice it, use it, use it over and over again. Find that use within your lessons, within your planning and just you, you, you kind of imagine you create, uh, you, you iterate, etc. You go through that process of just trying, thinking, trying, practicing, changing and improving. And, and that's the, literally what I've done. When you start with one thing and you really take the time to learn it and master it, with yes. my experience in ed tech, there are so many skills from that one thing that you're working on that will transfer into everything else that you're going to start using in the future. Oh, yeah, most definitely. I'll give you another round of applause for that. That is a very great point. The fact is, when it comes to digital literacy and the transfer of knowledge from one area to another, we know a lot more than we think. What often scares us is the user interface. We kind of look at it and it looks different. Maybe an update has come out and it looks slightly different. But the reality is, even what Tanya just showed with um, Adobe Spark, when I look at that, my geek brain kind of just pops off because I think, my goodness, this is the ability to have layers in imagery, the ability to remove backgrounds. So you're talking about like a, a really light version of Photoshop that's free for everybody. I just think, well, you know, so, but then it's breaking that down to help people to imagine. That's really what it starts with, with a lot of my training. It's helping people to imagine what can be done with a tool. And then as soon as you find that use, Joe, you know, once you see the use for that tool, you're thinking, yes, that is it. I'm, I'm going off. And you know what the thing is, too, is about imagination in technology. If you think of something and you want to do it in your classroom, but you don't know how, there is something out there to do it. Almost every time I've had an idea but didn't know if there was an app, if there was a tool, if there was a program, you yeah. just have to take some time to find it because it's most likely there. Yes, and it's all, usually a free version as well. It's yeah. usually free. You, we, we, we find the expensive version first. Everyone tells us like all the top results of the ones that you pay for, but there's so many free ones. With, with Spark as well, I keep going back to Spark, but I get excited about it because of how I was a senior leader in school when that came out, and I was just, I literally plugged it. We had a whole school approach to using um, uh, technology during STEM week, and uh, we did all kinds of, I had some kind of, um, I guess you could say famous people come in. I, 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 everyone knew, knew the royal wedding, right? So the lady who designed the outfit for the outfits for the kingdom choir, you know, the choir that sang at the royal yes. wedding? Yes. We had that lady come in uh, and teach fashion design because the, the young uh, year two children, I think it's grade one, I think, in America, they were designing clothes out of recyclable materials. So the idea was there to uh, uh, what could be done. And I really do think about things in terms of what skills can be applied in the real world. I can uh, okay, this is the tool, but how is this gonna be used? The, how can we get children to practice, you know, in a mini way, what could be done in the real world? So we had, uh, we, I had a few people come in at the different year group levels and yeah, it was great. 
I feel like you and I need to figure out how to collaborate in real life <laughs> outside of the classroom <laughs> because you and I right now are on the same wavelength. Yes. Now, when we, when we focus on how drastically education has changed in the past 365 days, mm. what, tor- what sorts of things and what sort of bits of advice are you giving to teachers as we move forward um, on what we've learned and what we can keep and what we might change? Yeah, so I, I think that bringing teachers through this transition period out of the panic phase into the new norm phase is really important. Most people, when they come out of the panic phase, and that is the knee-jerk reaction to, we have to do this right now. There is no, I mean, the, the, the senior leaders stand there, ignite their lightsabers, everybody has to do it, and they are forced to do it. Whenever you come out of that and we say, okay, we're, kind of, we're back now, people immediately drop it, unless there is a transition from thinking, okay, I have to do this, to I need to do this. So I'm trying to help teachers think, okay, in your daily practice beforehand, what types of things did you do? What types of things did you get up to? And most of it involves like killing a lot of trees to produce tons of paper for them to print off all these resources. And then I think, okay, right. So let's think about some tech that you've been exposed to. So then they explain and then we say, okay, so here's where you can save time. Here's where you can save paper. As soon as you see the purpose then they think, right, okay, I don't have to do this, but I want to do this. It's just trying to bring people to, through that transition. I, there are so many things that I never even thought of that I'm going to keep in my classroom too. Mm. And even when I'm inspired by the way that the world is changing, you know, you go to restaurants now and you see um, a QR code to get the menu. You know how many mm. times I use QR codes now in my classroom because I've been inspired by that? It's yeah. just, you have to keep up with the way the world is uh, yes, in definitely. your classroom so you can have real world learning happening every day. Yes, most definitely. Real world is what it's all about. I want to share something with you. Yes, please, can, do, please do. Bring up a sh- uh, screen. What I've got here is, I'm not going to play this one, but I love, like I said, it's about the real world experiences. Here is one small example of a learning journey I took my students on. Now, we decided we were going to make a song. And we went through all those processes you see on the left-hand side of the slides. Songwriting, rhyming couplets, metaphors, imagery, personification, science of sound. They did all of that in their learning journey. But the outcome was a music video. It was a fully-fledged music video. (laughs) They're all in it. They showed it to their uh, parents. It was absolutely amazing. They loved the process. But I, I did the music and helped with the video editing. But they were involved in every single step, even the music production. So, yeah, this is. So, yeah, that video, I mean. You can, you can watch that on YouTube, the whole video is there. It was used as like the, the school song uh, for, a, for, a, for a certain amount of time. I've done other things like uh, topic launches. We were talking about World War II. Pure drag. Uh, this is my version of uh, We uh, make her mama. We got oh, that's your We make her chicken the eggs. And then the eggs are dried under the sun. And we make sure they're whole. So I love we it. have pure dried whole eggs. Those eggs are good for you. They help you chase chickens. They help you run up the hill. And they help you roll down the hill. These eggs are good. And these eggs are all the way from Alabama. I love this. Pure, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we, we had, I've had so much fun in my career using technology, but the, there are so many reasons for the use of technology, but it links, it links, it links. It's all about considering the learning journey and not just saying, right, okay, this isn't technology. I've used tech in science, I've used it in history, I've used it in mathematics, I've used it in English, I've used it in all different subjects. And I think that really it's just knowing what can be done and how to do it 
and they're just running with those ideas. I think that's that's uh, one Roslyn of the main Robertson on YouTube says the same thing. She agrees with you very much. She says it can be overwhelming, but when you start with the apps and take them one app at a time, you can yes. really, you know, really build and do something great with that. Definitely. Definitely. Okay, this is uh, incredible. Again, my brain is going crazy and I might be doing some, you know, World War II commercials. In my yes, life. I know. I know. And I can I can come back as Dan and we can get those whole <laughs> pure dried whole eggs. And I can come down there to Essex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you come down here, right? And we can do a swap, right? Because I could do... I mean, sure. I mean, I could do an American accent if I if I really need to, but the the reality is, I don't exactly need to on a day to day. I just kind of from time to time maybe read out a book to the class and uh, talk like that. I gotta but, uh, tell you what, my British accent is all inspired from the Great British Bake Off. So now I can say yes. I'm absolutely gutted that my spoon <laughs> is overproofed. <laughs> yeah, you're right, you're right, that's, that's really good. Really good. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, if no, people please. want to still learn from you and find you, what, what place on the internet can they come to your Yes, local? so if you go to ocstechtips.com or at ocstechtips, you'll find me. So my website is there. You can book a one to one training session with me. Um, I also do corporate CPD for schools, um, but I've got a lot of free resources on the uh, YouTube channel. But like I said, for those people who want it broken down step by step, I'll be happy to just book a session through my website, octechtips.com. No apostrophe. OC, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Joe. Take care. What a great guy. I'm so glad that we were able to uh, learn from him together. Now, I have been talking to you guys about giving away some extra credit with some prizes. So let me go ahead and give you a little challenge that Adobe and I put together for you. This is the Spark Remix Challenge. And if you participate with the Spark Remix Challenge, you can win uh, some really cool stuff from Adobe. You're going to win an Adobe Creator Educator Kit, and we're giving away a lot of them. So you might want to participate. There is a link that you're going to click, um, which we're going to bring up on the bottom of the screen. But as there it is, uh, I'm going to share my screen with you right now and show you exactly what we're asking you to do. You know, this is the part when you uh, are teaching and you're like, I'm going to and share my screen. Ah, here we go. Okay. So this is the Adobe Spark Remix Challenge. And what we're doing is we are instilling creativity in educators all over the world. So all you have to do is click that link, go in here and just put the words in. So I teach insert subject. I'm going to change that to kinder garden oh you see technology is never on your side it's not going to work with me uh so if that said kindergarten i will infuse creativity in my classroom by let's do this starting small 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 and building up done starting small and building up and then you're going to go ahead and download it and you can share it. Now, when you share it on any form of social media, take a look at these hashtags. Hashtag creativity for all. Hashtag Adobe EDU creative. When you share your remix, okay, we are going to be giving you Adobe creative educator kits. In there is the t-shirt that you saw Nicholas wearing earlier today. You got some great posters, some cards that you can give, a beautiful kit, you know, use it all in your classroom. And that's going to be our little challenge to you. I'm going to make one. I'm going to post it. And I cannot wait to see the ones that you guys make and post as well. Thank you so much for joining us for this little Saturday extra credit. This isn't the last one. Oh, no, no, it's not. We're going to be giving you more extra credit on March 20th, same time, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we got some more educators from all over the world who are going to be joining us, sharing their knowledge with us, sharing their stories with us, and most importantly, getting creative with us. Hey, thanks for joining us, you guys, and I will see you again on March 20th for extra credit sponsored by Adobe. Thank you to Adobe. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. Nicholas, Tanya, Osi, great people. Couldn't do this without them. We'll see you guys on the 20th.
Bye.